we've taken a few tangents, but let's uh, continue on the thread of T-Rex. Yeah. Go, go to the skull. Yeah. So uh, the skull of T-Rex is iconic. So you, you describe it as being incredibly robust and overbuilt. Yeah, there's a lot of bone on there. Uh, so we mentioned a couple of other things like Giganotosaurus, so this you know giant carnivore. Uh, if you put Giganotosaurus T-Rex in, that's the one. So that's, yeah, that's on my old blog. It's not my image. Um, uh, what are we looking at on the left so and the right? you got T-Rex on the left in orange and Giganotosaurus on the right in red. As I said, they're pretty similarly sized, but just look at the robusticity. Like the front of the snout of T-Rex is all bone. And yet the major opening, this is a thing called the antorbital fenestra, the opening in front of the orbit, is absolutely massive in Giganotosaurus. It's like half the skull. The opening at the back of the skull is much bigger. The opening in the lower jaw is much bigger. And actually the jaw, what you can't see side to side is much thinner. So the heads are the same size. And as animals, they are about the same linear dimensions but you can just see there's just way more bone <laughs> in the t-rex it's incredible so it, this is like it's not overbuilt it's obviously it's evolved that this is the right amount of bone for the stresses and strains for what it's doing and how it's acting but you compare it to anything that's not a very large tyrannosaur and suddenly you see just how much bone has gone into it it is a very large it's an absolutely large head, but it's a very heavy head with a lot of bone. And a lot of that bone is there to resist all the forces of all the muscles because it has this giant, super powerful bite, which again, you can see in the teeth. So the bone and the muscles kind of evolve together. To yeah, bigger yeah, and yeah. Bigger and bigger and bigger. So you need this kind of structure for the power that uh, yeah. the crush has. So one of the big things uh, tyrannosaurs have, uh, and this goes all the way down to the, the, the earliest tyrannosaurs were like our size, <laughs> like little ditty things, like two, three meters long, be a meter and a half tall um but they have fused nasals so the pair of bones that in us there's not a lot there but obviously in something like a dog or something like a baboon with a long nose it's like the whole top of the snout and there's two one each side in tyrannosaurs they fuse together so they forms a solid bit of bone so the whole top of the nose is solid and then that makes the skull just fundamentally more rigid and able to take more power through it the very early ones weren't super biters i suspect but they do also, but they do have the little flattened teeth at the front. So I strongly suspect the fused nasals, at least originally, is for resisting that. Because again, if you've got a long nose and you're pulling with quite a lot of force at the very tip, that's going to bend your snout. So strengthen that. Can you speak to the evolution from the smaller to the bigger of the T-Rex? What, what were some of the evolutionary pressures? What like what, what What's the story of the so evolution? So Tyrannosaurs go back to the middle Jurassic. So Tyrannosaurs around for 100 million years. So from about 160-ish, 165-ish million years till the extinction, 66.5, I think is the current dating on that. So yeah, you've got 100 million years of them. And the middle Jurassic, annoyingly, is probably the bit of the Mesozoic, so the whole dinosaur period, that we know the least of. Just by chance, we just don't have many rocks exposed of the right age that are fossil bearing. Um, but we got two or three Tyrannosaurs from that time. And yeah, they're, they're really quite diddy. Yeah, they'd be chest high to us. Two or three meters long, including the tail, probably more like three, a lot of them. Um, little heads, long arms. They, they look like every other carnivore going. There's, there's not a lot special to them um, at this point. They've only just separated from their nearest groups, which is actually something like the ancestors of Giganotosaurus, actually. Um, they do have the fused nasals early on. They do have these special little teeth at the front of the jaw very early on. They're feathered early on. Definitively, we have skeletons with feathers on them that are early tyrannosaurs, uh, at least until the early Cretaceous. Um, but yeah, they're knocking around as relatively small animals in Europe and Asia. We have a couple from the UK. Uh, we have a whole bunch from China. There's stuff from like Kyrgyzstan and places like this. I think there's one, a relatively early one from Russia. Um, and then when they get into the early Cretaceous, they start getting quite a bit bigger. Uh, so something like Eutyrannus, if you want to. There you go. So Eutyrannus is fuzzy. Um, we have three specimens definitively feathered. Um, it gets to <laughs> six, seven meters long. <laughs> There's something funny looking about the sexy, smaller, earlier version of the T-Rex. But, but again, this is seven, eight meters, maybe weighs half a ton or a ton. Like we, we are very much on the menu for an animal that size and it's yeah, yeah. massive and dangerous. 
quite what triggered them. There's general patterns in evolution of size change, and one famous one called Cope's Rule I've worked on a fair bit, which is the idea that over time things tend to get bigger, and they do for various different reasons, one of which is just pure, almost like diffusion. If you start small and you evolve, well, you can't get much smaller, but you can always get bigger. So you, you naturally kind of diffuse away. Whereas if you're a blue whale, you probably can't get much bigger and its descendants will probably end up being smaller. But there are reasons that bigger things do better. You can hunt more stuff. You're more energy efficient. You can move more efficiently. Um, you're dominant in contests, particularly with conspecifics. If you're trying to win a territory or win mating rights, bigger things usually beat up smaller things. So there's going to be selection favoring them. Um, but then big things don't usually do well in extinction events. So that tends to reset the clock by killing off the big stuff and then smaller stuff does better. Again. So mostly there's evolutionary advantages, but, but a fairly big one. So yeah, it's the, it's the classic thing of there's a day to day advantage of being bigger and that might last for a few million years, right up to the point that suddenly there's the biggest drought the earth has encountered in 5 million years. And then all the big stuff just gets nailed. Also, we should probably say, is this accurate to say that the bigger you get, the fewer of you there, there are, are yeah there's there's just less fundamental space you know there's more mice than there are elephants there are more elephants than there are whales like there's only so much biomass that an ecosystem can support and bigger things are just worse at repopulating in extinction yeah, events for example right so that, so, so they're less likely to survive because they need more fuel you know what would feed a mouse for a year won't feed an elephant for a week so if and and of course the mice are going to have an easier time finding a few little seeds than an elephant's going to find tons of food. And then they've got less genetic diversity. There might be 5,000 mice, there might be 200 elephants. So who's likely to have more genes or who's likely to have selection acting on those genes to produce a survivor? Well, the one with five or 10 or a thousand times the population. And then, yeah, on top of that, you've then got the very slow reproductive cycle, which then, again, gives evolution not a lot to work with if as an elephant you're breeding once every five years and as a mouse you're doing it once every eight weeks what can we say about the the evolution of just the the massive bone crushing power of so so that starts kicking in seriously kind of uteranicizing up so that's when you start getting they're not just bigger animals that are getting to a comparable size to the other big dinosaur carnivores of the time you start getting those bigger heads but even then, relatively late in Tyrannosaur evolution, so getting into kind of the middle part of the late Cretaceous, you, you see a split. And we have a group called the Aleoramines, um, which have really, really long, thin skulls. And they look much more like a kind of, there's a velociraptor, they look much more like a giant velociraptor-ish than a Tyrannosaur. Still relatively small arms, um, but... It's a, it's a very long snout, and so this is a fast-biting animal with a relatively light bite. So it's probably taking really quite small stuff proportionally. And then the other side, you've got the Tyrannosaur eins, which are the really big-headed ones. And so that is few ancestral things like Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus, um, from Al both from Alberta. Um, but then Daspolidosaurus, a thing I named called Juchang Tyrannus in China, and then Tarbosaurus and Tyrannosaurus. And you've really only got three or four of these ultra giants, which are all kind of 10 meters plus in size, and then have the really broad skull with the real kind of excessive bite force. But even things like Albertosaurus, which is, I mean, a big animal, seven, seven eight meters, yeah, a ton or so. They're not quite T-Rex, but they're definitely more robust than the other contemporaneous carnivores so there is this progression of getting bigger getting a bigger head the teeth get bigger but there's fewer of them building up the bone biting and the and the power um but with some interesting evolutionary off branches in the way that yeah cats are largely much of a muchness but then you get things like, like bobcats and lynx which are actually quite bulky stocky little cats that don't have the long tail and are doing something quite different can you just speak almost more generally because uh, T-Rex is sort of one of the great apex predators of history of Earth. How does an apex predator evolve? Like, what? why did T-Rex win? Why, why isn't everybody, why isn't there like a vicious I, race I, to the top? I, I, and I, have a, I have a problem with the term apex predator because um, ecologically, 
apex predators are generally defined as things that eat other predators. So a great white shark is because it's eating stuff like tuna and sea lions, which are themselves predators. So it's a predator of predators. Whereas people people love saying lions are apex predators and they love saying T-Rex is an apex predator. They're, they're eating herbivores. This is not some this is not some weird and unusual thing. They're the largest predator in their ecosystem. Uh, and they are a giant one. Uh, my friend Dyron Nash has moved to using the word arch predator. So it's like some kind of massive thing but avoiding the term apex because i think that leads into a it it, it it's a subtle terminology thing but like, uh an important one i just learned something today so i didn't understand i thought i was i was using the the word apex predators but that's because everyone keeps using it when i don't think they should right. and, and now you're getting into linguistics and it's like well if everyone uses it to mean that does it now mean that rather than what it should mean and then i'm probably losing that argument because actually you'll probably find way more stuff calling it an apex predator than you will an arch predator but but here we are arch predator beautiful i, I learned something today it's, but that would that you're saying t-rex didn't eat other predators well it's it's probably not going to so we can get into though i'd prefer not to because it's tedious the argument of whether or not there's these small things which some people have said is a different group called nanotyrannus or a different species called nanotyrannus but fundamentally t-rex is definitely weird even compared to all the other giant tyrannosaurs that are very closely related to it because it is by far ludicrously by far the largest carnivore in its ecosystem so so it doesn't really have competition actually i mean so so this is a velociraptor skull um, yep. <laughs> there are there are there are some carnivores that are a bit bigger than this yeah but not enormously so um which we're knocking around as t-rex that the skull's the same time <laughs> tooth crown right but but like you think about that yeah. and that's like going go, that's like going to africa and going okay there are lions What's the next biggest predator? And it's like, well, there's a weasel about this big. Yeah. Like, it, it's that kind of size difference. And you don't get that normally in ecosystems. So it didn't have some of the other big dinosaurs around it? Not carnivores. There's huge herbivores. But did, there's no huge carnivores. Oh, I see. Around. It would it would eat those the juvenile of the herbivores. Oh yeah, but it's not... going to be eating Triceratops, and Edmontosaurus, and Parasaurolophus. There's even a couple of giant sauropods God. knocking around in some places. It's it's going to be hoovering them up. But like, how often is it going to eat? Again, Velociraptor isn't there. But how often is it going to eat something the size of an adult Velociraptor? Yeah. I mean, they're a fraction of our size, and we're probably too small. Th th this is like lions hunting mice. Like, you're just not going to. But unless one like virtually runs into your mouth, you're not gonna go and try and eat it. So the question still stands about arch uh, predators. Then, like, how does it? How how do you win? <laughs> yeah, in evolution? well, I mean, so I mean, the, there's there's no real winners. There's just you know turnover because ultimately the birds, you know, it it it's it's still lost out when when things went wrong. And as we were just talking about, you know, things do tend to lose out when they're big. They're just so much more vulnerable to extinction. Um, but clearly, dinosaurian ecosystems had much bigger herbivores and therefore, by extent, much bigger carnivores than any system we've seen before or after. Um, even in relatively sparse ones like Spits of the Late Triassic, so when the dinosaurs are really just getting going, or the very early Jurassic, but you've still got some like multi-ton herbivores and then you've got some multiple hundred kilo predators so about as big as elephants and lions get today and then once you're in the jurassic and cretaceous it is entirely normal to have multiple species that are 10 20 30 tons plus as herbivores and anything up to five tons as a carnivore i mean t-rex is probably the biggest of them but carnivores that exceed Ter fully terrestrial carnivores that exceed a ton there's dozens of species of dinosaurs is it interesting to you that no other carnivore predator was able to develop in that environment over millions of years i mean the, they're probably just ecologically dominant in the way that mammals are now you know crocs get bigger than lions and tigers but they're fundamentally tied to the water but you don't see crocs roaming in the serengeti or anything like that um, but yeah, big, I mean, the really big crocs even now get to over a ton. So those are very serious animals. And I think big polar bears 
are in the like 500 kilo range. Though again, they hunt a lot of stuff in water and then things like grizzlies are at least partially herbivorous or omnivorous. So there was a very large marine reptile, Mosasaurus. Did T-Rex ever come across that? In theory, at least, the really giant mosasaurs are much bigger in the same way that, unsurprisingly, whales are much bigger than terrestrial carnivores now. Um, Jurassic Park, unsurprisingly, has rather exaggerated it. So the one from is it Jurassic World, it's like twice the size it should be. But some of these things were still like, you know, 15, 20 meters. But yeah, some of them are absolutely giant. We, we had one dug up in the UK just a couple of years ago, and I got to see the skull of it. Or a cast of the skull. And yeah, it's about the same size as a T-Rex skull. If we take a ridiculous detour before we get back to science, <clears throat> what creature in the history of Earth would challenge a T-Rex in a fight, would you say? What, on, what, on land? On land. I mean, nothing reasonably. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, the, the really yeah. big ones are going to be... The, the, the only other thing you can really add is the... I said, this might be a very British ad adage of it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Um, so yeah, maybe there's something a bit smaller, which is just hyper aggressive, and that would be enough to win. Like the, the classic honey badgers chasing off lions. It's not that a honey badger would win in a fight, but if the honey badger is prepared to put up that much of a fight and the lion really doesn't want to get hurt, then then he kind of technically wins. You can't imagine like like any of the cats can't, like tigers, I know yeah. them can do, I mean, the size difference, the power of the jaw, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but going to T-Rex, like what could reasonably challenge it? There's a couple of other giant tyrannosaurs, there's a couple of giant carcharodontosaurs from South America that I was say are comparable in linear measurements, but are probably rather smaller and rather lighter, in which case your money's going to be on the bigger guy with the bigger bite. And that simply is T-Rex. And the bite is important. Yeah, I think it is because yeah, these these guys, the carcharodontosaurs, they're they're much more cutting, and they're really killing stuff, probably by grappling with the arms because they do have big muscular arms with big claws, and then slashing away at stuff. So I think they're probably doing something more like almost like wolves or hyena or hunting dog, where they're harrying stuff and slashing at it, and you're basically bleeding them out. Mm. and wearing them down so what about that strategy so uh maybe you could speak to biting strategy so a uh, t-rex is a i guess a relatively slow bite but extremely powerful what about animals that have very fast bites so it's very simple mechanics you know if you have a very long jaw you're going to close faster but with less power at the tip than if you have a really short one that's deep and so that really is it um but yeah, let's say there's, there's things like the Aeoramines and then there's things like, yeah, Velociraptor and a lot of its relatives, really very, and not just small, but, you know, narrow. It is narrow snouted. There's not going to be a lot of fundamental strength here. The teeth, very numerous, very small. Um, so they're much more about grabbing something tiny. You know, Velociraptor's eaten rat sized stuff. That's going to be probably its primary diet. Or so so I wonder scale. if there's a bunch of smaller, fast biting things that could just bleed a T Rex to death. They're going to struggle, though. Um, I, I remember doing some work for one documentary, and they yeah, they literally wanted Velociraptor fighting a T-Rex. And I was like, you, you do know this is like, we're, yeah. we're going to shoot some meerkats killing a lion. And it's like, well, you can film it, but no one would believe it because, you know, these ankle-high things trying to, like, savage a shin bone are... Yeah, I'm sure they'll make some holes and it'll lose some blood and it may not be very happy, but it's, I don't think they're going to win. The size of a uh, Velociraptor was uh, exaggerated by Jurassic oh, Park. enormously. I mean, they get a bit bigger than this yeah. in, in terms of the skull. But yeah, they, they're kind of thigh high to me, like a meter or so to the top of the head, two meters long. Whereas in the movies, they're like standing taller than guys who are six foot. So it's just, massively massively scaled up and then these kind of big kind of domey heads then they're, they're not the really long narrow snout 